and time at NVIDIA. Broadly, what I work on is this idea of uh, what are the algorithmic foundations which would allow us to build general purpose robots? Uh, and I study particularly uh, mobility, uh, manipulation, but we have started uh, looking into mobility as well. Uh, the primary focus in terms of algorithmic understanding is to study inductive biases and causal understanding that will help us towards this uh, goal of uh, general purpose embodied intelligence. And I like to joke around as a researcher in robotics, it is my dream to achieve what I would call out of the box autonomy, where we can just buy the robot, bring it home and it works. Uh, this, it just works is, is not yet there. So if we think about this, uh, 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 the video that I was showing earlier, uh, even if we think of a simple robot that we might want to work in our houses, it might need to do a variety of tasks, let's say cleaning, cooking, laundry, vacuuming and so on. And more interestingly, it needs to work not only in control settings, but it needs to extend to diverse and complex scenes. Uh, so diversity is new tools. Complexity is, let's say, longer time horizons for problems that have not yet been seen. Now, it is not that we have not been able to build practical or in interesting systems. This is a video by Boston Dynamics for about uh, about three or four months ago, uh, Christmas video. And what you see is very impressive, uh, sophisticated robot systems doing very sophisticated moves. But the one thing that would might, that might stand out is it's a known structured environment and the whole thing is choreographed. In practice, however, when you put these systems in unstructured environments, they tend to fail. It turns out that long-term planning and general purpose perception in real robots, in real environments is, well, really hard. Uh, so what gives? The question really remains is how to achieve this algorithmic generalization? And we will define this notion of generalization uh, in many contexts in the sense of objects, scenes, semantics, tasks, and goals. So my research interest here centers around building general purpose intelligence. And we would like these systems to become our assistants or even companions. They're not necessarily here to replace us, but rather extend us and enrich our ability, both in a cognitive and physical sense. And I would argue this constitutes two steps. First step involves efficient skill learning. The system learns to do the task in the same setup using some instructional input. This instructional input can be kinesthetic demonstrations, language, videos, or some other form of interaction with the robot. Thereafter, we need algorithmic mechanisms that achieve generalization through what you would think, can think of as self-improvement. So what you're doing is you're basically thinking about first how to specify the task, and then you are thinking about how to generalize the task to similar setups beyond what you have seen explicitly. Now, one could argue if this is just copying, uh, it must be easy. Actually, it turns out copying or imitation is not trivial. Right? You need to think about how the task is specified. Uh, first order of uh, imitation can be imitative babbling, where you're basically just copying the skills. It looks like what you're doing is, is what you're told to do, but nothing is happening. A second order can be, as you grow up, understanding dexterity. So you can actually do sequencing of skills to achieve some sort of task. And finally, the highest order is causality. You understand the semantic purpose so you can achieve the same task with a different set of actions. Now, we can argue that uh, machine learning has given us a lot of advances in the last few years, particularly in vision and language. Uh, model size has grown, uh, data sets have become large and varied, and consequently, performance has improved. Uh, and one could argue uh, this sort of progress in both vision and language sits on three main ingredients. One is large structured models. These are structured models which are highly overparameterized and often have particular kind of structured biases, whether it's CNNs or transformers. Second is IID data and the fact that you have a lot of data sets which are both sort of uh, concise in problem definition, uh, easy enough to label and collect at large scale. And finally, distributed compute and deployment. You can train your inference engines on very large scale compute and then deploy it in a manner that doesn't necessarily interact with training. But surprisingly, robotics is very different, 
robotics is embodied interactions. People find creative solutions to problems that often break these assumptions. Uh, so robotics, interestingly, does not have large scale model sizes. Uh, data sets are very small, very task specific and often non-IID. And finally, because of the fact that deployment is tied to training, uh, you cannot do deployment in independent of training and hence uh, compute usage is very minimal. So this will form the broad sort of overview of today's talk. And I'll, I'll talk about abstractions and learning algorithms that inject uh, inductive bias and in priors to achieve this generalization at all, all three of these stages. So let's talk about structure first. So what, what do we mean when we talk about structure? Machine learning researchers, again, have recognized the need for correct learning biases to suit the need of domains. So recent progress uh, in representation for both perception and language uh, has led to incredibly successful models such as ResNets or transformers. Yet, uh, it is often argued that intelligence is built for interaction. But few of these models actually address the issue that come with an embodied decision-making system. So let's think of how we model these embodied decision-making systems. One mechanism is uh, modeling this as a, a Markov decision process, which is a core object in reinforcement learning. Uh, a simple MDP can be thought of as essentially an agent that takes in a state, outputs an action, and uh, during the learning step, it has some sort of learning rule that allows it to update its own uh, beliefs. Uh, in terms of a robot, if you think about this, the state can be, let's say, an image uh, or uh, proprioception. Actions for a robot can be taught, can be something else. The agent itself can be, let's say, a neural network uh, model, but it can be other things, of course. And finally, the learning rule can be more familiar Q learning or policy learning updates, but there are a variety of things we can do. So the question we are asking is, are there better state and action representation that will lead to generalization in robotics that are not common in, uh, in, in language and vision? So let's look at something very sort of intuitive. If you were to think of opening doors, if you were opening new doors, would you, how would you go about it? Even if you did not know how to open that particular door, the fact that you bring in priors in, in interacting with environments allows you to operate in much more efficient manner than let's say a robot, which might learn to open a door in a manner that is completely unnatural. Uh, it may work based on your reward function, but it may not actually be useful. Why? Because often when we do these tasks implicitly, there is a latent, often low dimensional manifold that achieves progress. Whether it's a door opening task where you're opening a door, you only need to explore in one dimension, or if it's a wiping or let's say a cleaning task where you only need to operate in the plane of the task rather than in all possible directions and forces. Let's talk of wiping as an example. If you were to build a wiping control with a current robot system, how would you go about this? One solution can be a model-based uh, system. So you can build a robot model, you can treat the robot end effector as a point mass and convert the desired end effector state to a robot joint state with a robot model. However, setting the desired state requires a model of the task uh, to schedule gain parameters in the sense that when you're wiping, you're going to go to the table. So this is phase one of the task and then wiping. That's phase two. So you have to schedule different gain parameters, understanding the model of the task. And also explicit state is often very task specific. So you have to track, build trackers to do these things. So one approach to building such a controller can actually be uh, deep reinforcement learning. You can argue that the policy takes image inputs and outputs joint torques. And these methods have been broadly applied to a variety of skill learning use cases. Uh, the method is agnostic to, in the sense that there is no environment model. However, these models are very sample inefficient in the sense that they need the robot, uh, they need sort of like, they need to learn the robot model. And often these methods are also very brittle to changes between training and test setups. So now the key insight is, can we get best of both worlds? Uh, or how can we get best of both worlds, if at all? So one way to think about this is to inject structure. 
So earlier we were thinking about directly policy converting images or observations into talks, but now we talk about perhaps we don't need the policy to learn the robot model. Policy only needs to learn the environment or the task model. How can we do this? We can think about specific output spaces for the policy uh, to operate in. One such specific output space is called variable impedance task space. And I'll describe what does that mean. So what this means is in the setup now, the policy outputs, it's, uh, outputs the output space of policy is a particular space that may not be talks, but it allows uh, a known model of the robot to uh, convert this into, uh, into the robot talks. This output space can be, let's say, pose and velocity of the end effector, but also the impedance gains. So earlier, we talked about this idea of different phases of the task and requiring to schedule gains. But we can give the policy the ability to schedule gains directly. And in doing so, what happens is you don't need to model the task. So you don't need a behavior tree of reaching phase one and phase two. You can still operate with image states. And uh, you can leverage all of the good things we know about model-based control, such as compliance, uh, and it's sam sample efficient and transferable. So just to give you a sense of how this would work, you can think of uh, a surface wiping task with image as input with a simple guided reward model. And uh, in here, the you know, key thing to note is the learning curve. The top one, devices, uh, and the difference between that and the direct joint works. Uh, all of the other baselines or other ideas of what other possible uh, action spaces can be are in the middle. But the important thing to note is by choosing a very good action space that enables reinforcement learning in a much more efficient manner. And what you're seeing in the video is inset is what the robot sees and, and the big video is what sort of uh, for viewer, the task is to clean up this green uh, debris on the table. And then the robot is going in and doing so from pure images. Interestingly, because we are using a pure uh, sort of model-based setups for outer space or, or outer loop, we can actually swap robots. So we can train a robot for Franca and then let's say transfer it to a Sawyer. So what you see on the left is basically transferring the policy from one robot to another robot in simulation. You can also use the same idea to go from sim to real. You can train purely in simulation and then apply this idea to a real robot. And notice that we are not using any, um, any complicated and sophisticated domain randomization techniques here. The only thing that we are arguing is if you know what inductive biases should be on the policy, what should be the input and output space of the policy, you can do much, much better than uh, vanilla reinforcement learning. Now, this idea that I, I talked about is not just limited to uh, manipulation. We extended this idea to legged locomotion with policy learning, uh, desired body accelerations, which are then converted to ground reaction forces and then to leg torques. So what that means is we can now uh, do reinforcement learning in a simplified model, simplified centroidal model, and then convert them to actual ground reaction forces using known robot models and uh, quadratic programming solvers. What that results in is again, something where now if you train an RL model on a, on a legged robot and flip the legs, a standard policy will completely fail because this is too different of a task to do. However, in this centroidal model version where RL has learned to walk, you can flip the robot legs and still be able to walk completely fine. In fact, you can do the same again, where you can train the model in a simulated robot on a different setup and then put it on a real robot directly and, and uh, the performance is successful out of the box. So, so far in both of these methods, in both manipulation and mobility, we used expert insight to construct the right action space. In manipulation, we used vices. In, uh, in mobility, we use a centroidal model. Now we ask the question, can we learn this action space instead? And uh, uh, so we are interested in finding a mapping such that uh, the new mapping captures the latent manifold, manifold of this family of tasks. In the sense that if you're trying to open the door, you should learn the fact that there is only one dimension in which exploration is useful, otherwise it's not. 
So what you really need is to learn a mapping where you can learn that this mapping is state condition, depends on the state. Uh, you can still control in this latent space or latent action space. And finally, this is equivalent or translation invariant. So a, an action applied in state S uh, is, will have the same effect compared to an action applied in, let's say, state S prime. So how do we learn a mapping like that? You start with, let's say, a demonstration database, uh, which is state action states pairs. And you model this as a, a auto encoder sort of encoder decoder model, which is reconstructing low level actions from latent actions. A prime here are the latent actions or A bar. One thing that we do is to enforce dynamics uh, or equivalence. So you're basically saying that the dynamics or the effect of actions is the same whether you apply the low level or the high level actions. You can do this in a manner that is uh, offline in the sense that the data can come from expert policies or pre-trained policies, or you can also do it online where you're collecting this, this data buffer simultaneously while you're learning the policy itself. So now qualitatively, we evaluate results first on this door opening task. We see that laser action space. So in this case, we take some data, train a new action space, and then do policy learning on this action space. Can learn to perform this task while, uh, while a, a low level action space like SAC uh, purely in TORS is not able to actually make a lot of progress. The robot is moving very slowly. A more interesting setup is when you can do transfer. So you can train uh, at the action space on one particular task data, but then you go to a different task, let's say opening a door to a different angle, or maybe opening a slightly different door. Uh, then the policy still learns to transfer this action space. So quantitatively, what we observed is that offline laser improves policy learning efficiency in a nearly zero shot manner. So you're basically saying if you have discovered that that the task is uh, basically just in this dimension, one dimension, then even random exploration can yield reward, which is not true if you're operating in six dimensional talk space, right? It works nearly zero shot, but you can argue that, oh, it must have memorized the solution. So does it work on slightly different tasks? Yes, it does. So you can take this action space and transfer it to a new task. Notice what we're doing. We are collecting data, we are training an action space, and then we are doing RL in this action space. And I'm, my argument is that, that the new action space allows you to transfer much better than the policy itself. Now you can say that, oh, but well, the policy already is known, so why do you need to learn anything? Uh, what if you don't have experts? You can do this online as well. So in this case, we have shown that you can learn action space and policy simultaneously, but that while there's no gap during the learning in this case, the advantage is that you've learned the action space that will now generalize. So every subsequent policy that you need to learn in this domain will be faster. So the same idea here applies in this case where you train the policy to wipe, let's say straight lines. Uh, and now you can put the same policy that has learned straight lines to wipe circles. You have never seen circles, but the fact that you can compose them on the fly allows you to uh, learn much faster. So, so far I've talked about this idea where you're learning the action space for a policy, but a similar idea could also be used to improve assistive teleoperation. Uh, so we took this idea and made the constraint to be input from human rather than from a policy. We collected demonstrations from users in full action space and then trained a two dimensional latent action space for user control. So the user is now controlling a robot with a joystick. It's a six off robot. And then we actually did user studies and all users found it helpful to control the robot in this learned action space compared to true action space. So they were, they were doing these uh, pick and place tasks and the fact that they were much faster with the learned action space is a testament to the thing that the users find it much easier to operate in these learned action spaces. So, so far we talked about this idea of action space transformation, which is the yellow block in the image. But you can actually do that with input transformation as well. So we have worked on generalizable input representations where you can learn state representations of both visual and tactile information such that 
it's the representation that transfers, not the policy. In the same way we talked about action spaces, it's the action representation that transfers. Once you learn the right representation, policy learning is very easy. So far, we also uh, only talked about input and output representations, but the lack of structure is not limited to those. We have found that agent model itself has can be improved with better architectures. So for example, you can use dense nets uh, in policies, which can improve performance. We have also found that bootstrapping the queue learning update may only learn a unimodal policy, a one way to do the task. But a, a, a cumulative accessibility function, which is basically learning reachability, includes horizon as a conditioning variable that allows multimodal policies to trade off performance and risk. And finally, you could argue that the need for structure grows more apparent as the learning tasks become a bit more complicated and hierarchical. So we have shown that self-supervised hierarchical latent variable models can capture multi-scale dynamics, which is basically not just what you need to do now, but also high-level decision-making, which requires continuous and discrete decision-making, which block to push in this environment and how much to push it back. Similarly, we have also reformulated the sequential planning problem as a program induction problem. In this case, it allows us to inject structured compositional priors, such as neural programs or task graphs in the decision-making system. These modular structures achieve one-shot generalization to long-term sequential planning tasks, even from video inputs. So the key takeaway from part one of this talk is that decision-making both at the skill level and hierarchical level can benefit from useful inductive biases such as modular representations to achieve generalization. And, and new kinds of inductive biases for, for decision-making and reinforcement learning that, issues, that address issues of compositional generalization uh, across family of tasks are needed. What we have shown is only the fact that such representations exist but they are not very commonplace in robotics yet. So then, so far we talked about how or what representations can be useful. The second part of the talk is about, can we discover these representations in a data-driven manner? So yet again, we look uh, to our friends in vision and language for, for inspiration. Large-scale supervision has really accelerated a lot of progress in both vision and language, and in general, other fields where applied AI has found a foothold. However, robot learning has not yet witnessed uh, this uh, similar revolution, if you will. And one could argue it's not for lack of trying. Roboticists have been working with data-driven approaches for a reasonably long time in a variety of domains, such as large-scale manipulation, uh, grasping, and even imitation learning. But one could argue the problems are that these methods have been either too skill-specific, focusing on short horizon skills, or the data is often platform dependent. And finally, the data set themselves, especially for in imitation learning, has been very small, exhibiting very low diversity. So the real question that we are trying to ask is, if we have to scale uh, data-driven learning to robotics, where is the data going to come from? And how are we going to get it? So just to understand what sort of data are we talking about? We start with simple skills like visual motor skills. Then we talk about, let's say, compositional planning. Then we can talk about even task structure, like how to make eggs from videos. And one of the things you would note is as the task structure goes more complicated and sophisticated, the data set size grows smaller. But to achieve any sort of vision where we can actually get robotics, uh, where robots can learn from, uh, from humans in a very natural sense, we will need to scale uh, our data sets with more structured supervision. But the question is how? What do we need? We need data set that we can collect for manipulation that has diversity of problem solving approaches in the sense that multiple kinds of uh, solutions are shown. The data should contain dexterous manipulation, not just simple point and click interfaces. And finally, the data should be large scale such that it is exposed to many problem instances. Now, the insight here is that we can use crowdsourcing uh, very much like uh, other domains in AI. However, we are looking to get demonstrations, not just labels. What does this mean? We want users to actually be able to control the robots in a teleoperated sense, completely remotely, without the use of specialized hardware. So we have built 
what we call RoboTurk, a platform that allows remote users to control robots in real time. Operators see a video uh, of the workspace in their web browser, and then the motion of their phone is coupled with the, uh, the robot, allowing for natural dexterous control of the, of the arm. Now, this allows us to have several simultaneous users to teleoperate both simulated and physical robot arms. Uh, for real robot tasks, we used three robots, and each task required multiple minutes of continuous interaction to complete the task. And the platform can be used to collect demonstrations from operators regardless of their location. In fact, for just fun, we collected demonstrations when I was out in the Swiss Alps uh, uh, collecting real robot data over 2G, and my friend Ajay was out in Macau controlling real robots uh, in Menlo Park uh, using this system. Using the system, we actually collected two data sets that covered three manipulation tasks and had over 100 user hours of demonstrations. And this is all very high quality data uh, and was about 10x the size of nearest data set at the time. So, so far, we have talked about, well, we have data, what next? We can talk about learning, but learning how? What are the problems? So the question is, now that we have this data set, what can we do with this data set? Can we learn purely from this external experience without actually interacting? So the setup that we are operating in is, you have data sets, you have a data set buffer, you can do learning in an offline setting, whatever you want, you can, but then when you want to deploy the policy, uh, you don't get to sort of uh, train anymore from this data set. So you're not learning in an interactive RL setting, you're learning in an offline setting. So it's not that uh, people have not attempted offline RL, but often those data sets have been very simplistic game environments with dense rewards. Uh, on the contrary, when we talk about robot manipulation, especially when data is from real humans, uh, the data can be very unstructured. An example of what unstructured data means here is, uh, there are many ways to fail and many ways to succeed. And usually, if you think about algorithms that learn from these data sets, they may not be able to capture such multimodality in a uh, vanilla sets. So first of all, we came up with an algorithm which we called IRIS, implicit reinforcement at scale. What we do here is, it is a hierarchical policy learning mechanism which learns a low level and a high level policy. The high level policy, uh, the low level policy is an imitation based a uh, goal following policy where uh, it follows short term goals to give you sequence of actions. The interesting thing is this is unimodal. On the contrary, we handle the uh, multimodality of data by creating a high level goal selection mechanism, which is essentially a generative model, which captures the multimodality of the data by generating or setting high level goals. So high level goals can be let's say a goal for the low level policy for one second out, even though the whole task may be much longer. So just to give you a sense of how this may work, if you do pure behavior cloning directly from supervised learning kind of setup, or even a more sophisticated method where you are doing batch constraint queue learning, which is an offline RL algorithm, both of these methods may fail in presence of some, uh, in presence of multimodal data. But in our case, we are able to learn this task of picking and placing, which is a sequential task uh, from this data purely in an offline setting. What this means is, what you see here is, on the left, there's a, a jittery image which is showing you how the goals are being set. And then the goal condition imitation is basically trying to generate sequences, then sequences, which will follow these goals. In terms of, uh, quantitative numbers, we can not only do this purely from state-based information or ground truth proprioception, but also image-based information where we use unsupervised key point representations, which are learned on this data set uh, without explicit labels. And in this, using those key point representations, you can already get over 40% success rate purely from data. Notice that this is not interacting. So sample efficiency uh, is not a concern. So you can actually learn from data and, and, uh, and learn to achieve these tasks, uh, even let's say half the time. Okay, so, so far we talked about two points. One, data is useful. We talked about if you learn from this data, then you can actually do better. Now, the question is, is data enough or can we use it better or can we use it more efficiently? 
feel free to ask questions if you have uh, any clarifications. Uh, otherwise, of course, we will definitely be uh, answering questions at the end. So in terms of how to use more data more efficiently, let's play a very simple game first to understand what does data augmentation mean. So let's say you have a pool table with two balls and I'm giving you two data points, uh, one with blue ball, one with orange. And I ask you, can you tell me if this data point, given the data points that you've seen so far, is a viable data point? Is this something that you can uh, believe can happen? One could argue that yes, because you can combine orange ball from the, uh, the left and the blue ball from the right into this mechanism. Now, what about this one? Is this a viable data point? You would argue that perhaps no, because we do not know what happens when they interact. We have no evidence uh, of them interacting. The same idea, by the way, applies for robots. You can have a bimanual robot, which is, let's say, uh, doing tasks independently. And then you can say that when these tasks are such that, that the arms are not interacting, even though they are operating in the shared workspace, that uh, you can augment data. But whenever they interact, uh, let's say to do a handover task, uh, then you have to actually see the data. So this is uh, what we will do. We'll talk about how to codify this or how to sort of algorithmically do this. First of all, the idea of uh, data augmentation is very popular and actually is very uh, meaningful as well, both in terms of states where people have done goal relabeling in the sense that you try to do something, but you end up doing something else. Instead of throwing that data away, you just say that, well, that was the thing that was uh, that I was, even though, even though I did not reach the correct goal, but wherever I reached, I can use this data point in a manner that is useful. Uh, same goes for vision, where you can do visual relabeling uh, by adding jitter in the background or foreground, and, and it makes your uh, algorithm very robust. So in both of these cases, one of the insights was implicitly, even though they don't say this formally, uh, they are exploiting the independence of causal mechanisms that is guiding transition dynamics in the sense that the goals and, and rendering process are independent of how the dynamics evolves Hence, you can do this relabeling without tampering with the problem structure. The question we are asking is, can we do this in a manner that is general purpose, always true? To do so, you have to do some sort of causal inference. You have to understand what is the two independent mechanisms such that when they are independent, you can relabel one of them without changing the other. So what does this mean? It allows us to essentially create a model uh, of the causal model of the generative system, but you don't need a full sort of uh, dense dynamics model. It's not global. Uh, so what does it mean to be global? So in the sense that uh, the data points may be independent at some points in time, but not every, everywhere. If you learn a simple uh, global model, it may not always be independent and you may not be able to use uh, this idea or this sort of insight that uh, if they are independent, you can swap labels. What does this mean? So a global model basically can mean in this two ball simple environment is that time uh, evolution is dependent on both walls always. While what we are arguing is there are many time points in the, in the sequence where this is not true. So we can start by, uh, by thinking about the globally applicable causal model on the left. But if we condition on the set of states where the balls are far apart, then we get a local model where the two balls are causally independent. And formally stating, these are structural causal models where you can basically say that uh, 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 if you marginalize the global model on all possible states and transitions, the balls, uh, uh, the model, uh, the local causal model uh, results in two separate cliques, if you will. So. How do we learn these causal models? One simple way to think about this is, let's say in the same example of balls, you have state defined as x, y position and their velocity. Then uh, you can learn an adjacency matrix over time, xt and xt plus one. And the, to be able to say that uh, the model is causally independent or locally causally independent, all you have to observe is that locally the Jacobian 
is a block diagonal matrix, which means that orange ball only depends on orange ball, while blue ball only depends on the blue ball in the past. So locally, now if I swap the blue ball's position to something else, let's say t plus one prime, uh, it gives me a new data point, while this new data point is completely valid, uh, as long as they're not interacting. So what does this give us? Essentially, at smaller data set sizes, we see CODA nearly triples the overall performance in the sense that you can achieve the same level of performance with much less data by using this idea of data augmentation. But more importantly, when the data becomes or the task becomes much more complicated, look at the x-axis. Now this is 10, 30 times more samples. Uh, adding data results in not only performance efficiency, but actually results in a much higher final performance as well. So the task here is very simple. You have to push a block uh, in the second setup. The task is to push two blocks in sequence. Uh, and uh, in both of these cases, you're operating with state spaces, uh, not, not image spaces. And uh, uh, x-axis here is the number of interactions with and without code. Any questions so far? OK. So finally, so now we have talked about this idea of have data, do learning, and then improve, uh, improve learning with the same fixed data set if you can do causal inference. So, so far, we were doing causal inference in a very simple environment. Uh, but what if uh, we can learn the structure in more complicated environments? So let's say you have to learn the structure of more complicated physics uh, environments. Let's say what is what is the physics model of this simple system? You would argue it's one ball bouncing on some flat surface, and there doesn't seem to be damping because it doesn't sort of slow down. You, what about this one? Well, I'm just kidding with you. It's just more balls with the same model. Look at this one. This one is slightly different. Perhaps you'll spot the difference. Notice how the yellow ball. Uh, changes direction mid-air. Why? Can you guess the model? One could argue it's, it's somehow, I do not know what the connections are, but they're all sort of in a box, but they're behaving very erratically. Uh, and, and here, one could argue that uh, it's because there are latent connections that you don't see. These balls are connected by uh, a rigid rod, a string, a string, and so on and so forth. And notice, you can train this model on a particular data set to just learn this system. But then what if I change the graph, underlying graph? I change the kind of connections. I change their, their spring constants and, and rigid rod lengths. Then suddenly, it's different. So you, need to, you cannot memorize. You need to generalize to new latent graphs. Now, in this case, at least the variables were visible. What about cases where even the variables are hard? What about deformable objects? Let's say folding a shirt. You can tell me that, oh, but I've seen many app policies which can, which can fold the shirt, so it's what's new. Well, they can only do it for that particular shirt. What if we want to do it for general purpose garments, pants, pantsuits? And if you think that is simple, then, well, you need to look for women's tops. Uh, uh, they are extremely complicated, and I do not know how to even store or use them. Uh, it's very hard to figure out how to get in and out of them, so how, let alone fold them. So then in this case, we will have to resort to causality or causal discovery. So if you have a single sort of end-to-end -end model learning these kind of dynamics, you can try to fit the model, but you will not be able to generalize. Then, of course, you can have better encoder-decoder style models like VAEs, but then uh, generalization will be limited because... Do you have a question? Okay, uh, so generalization will be limited. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I argue that if we have causal latent discovery, then we can generalize to many more domains. So what would this look like? So first of all, we can argue that we have a system where we represent the environment in a manner that is completely unsupervised. So we take a video input and we do a perceptual representation learning as a set of key points. So uh, this is completely unsupervised and can be learned through uh, a reconstruction objective. Thereby, we learn what a causal linking of these key points can be. 
So in this balls environment, the causal linking can be different kinds of edge types, and then edge parameters are confounders such as length, stiffness, and so on. And finally, you learn a dynamics model on top of this, which allows you to predict the future of the environment. And this is the only time you get lost because notice we don't supervise with true ground truth causal model. We only supervise with, uh, with future prediction. Now, essentially what this allows us is to model these environments. Let's say in this balls environment, first of all, you can predict the graph. Uh, the third from right uh, is a model where you're only doing predictions on the perception model. So where would the key points be if you were not predicting uh, time. And finally, the fourth model is if you are actually predicting the dynamics, looking at only first 10 frames of the model. Interestingly, you can do this for more complicated environments where ground truth is not even available. So you can build a model of the towel by just watching what uh, the towel is doing in a video. Uh, and this reduced order model allows you to predict uh, in a manner that is controllable. You can do use the same model to model a shirt now. Notice it's not like different weights or retrained with a different data set. It's just the same model. Same thing works for pants as well. So what we now have essentially is the same model that can capture very many different kinds of dynamics in a causal sense and can generalize to different, let's say geometry. So pants become shorts or pants have slightly different stiffnesses or, or the sleeve length changes or the size changes. All of that is modelable. Interestingly, because we have uh, a model that is causal in this sense, we can actually do generalization. So what does this mean? So first of all, we can talk about the correlation of the rest length of the spring relation in the sense that we do not have ground truth in training. However, the parameter of the confounding variable that we are discovering, does it have a correlation with the spring variable? And it turns out that in, in all of our cases, the correlation is very high, which means that we are not discovering true physics, but some the model that the system is discovering is similar to that. Uh, we can also evaluate the model on prediction error. So you can think of if you use pure interaction networks or graph-based models, they may not be able to model the setup because in every data point or every instance, the underlying generative model can actually be different. While graphical models are good at learning mechanisms, they don't generalize across mechanisms. And because this is a full causal model, you can do counterfactual generalization, which means that if you have a data point, you can ask this question. Can I, uh, what would have happened if you have, let's say, changed the length of the rigid rod? or length of the spring was different. And in both of these cases, uh, what you see here is the purple region is where the variability was within training set, while uh, the orange or the pink region is where the variability uh, is on parameters that were not shown in the training set. And then the error is on prediction. So, so far in this particular part of the talk, what we talked about is, that structured supervision through scalable crowdsourcing is required to give us this sort of treasure trove of, of data. And finally, causal discovery is a vital component in discovering the correct inductive biases that will result in the compositional generalization that we want. So I realize that we are at uh, 45 minutes past. I will take five more minutes to talk about practical issues of uh, robotics. We have to consider issues of deployment. So what does deployment mean? So consider the pipeline of learning, especially offline learning, which may look like when you train in with your data set, then you deploy on a realistic setup. And then really, you really hope that it works. If it doesn't, well, it's back to the drawing board. Uh, so this is a fun little video where Boston Dynamics own video, own, own robot actually faltered on stage uh, on, on like a high profile event, if you will. So this problem, by the way, is not limited to just manipulation or legged locomotion. Uh, this is much more critical for mission critical applications for such as medicine, autonomous driving, and even space exploration. Uh, in both of these cases, policy and regulation requires that we generate behavior of models uh, before deployment rather than uh, rather than coming up with guarantees after the fact. So what is the question here? 
So let's start with safe exploration, where we, the idea is that, can we build systems which can handle safety constraints during deployment? So what does this mean? Let's say a simple example. I want my robot, which can stand initially, but I want it to run. But I don't want it to fail during that process very much, maybe because it's costly or it's infeasible in some cases. So what does this mean? That, uh, that I want it to respect some failure constraint during training. So I don't want it to fail or the failure probability or the number of failures should be limited. And again, this kind of example can be given for manipulation where you are pushing a cup uh, full with water and you don't want the cup to spill over. So what does this mean? We can specify some sort of constraint, maybe in a very simple sense. Failure is a zero one binary constraint and it's easy to understand what is going on and, and also check. So with that, I can specify a standard RL problem where there's cherry on the cake, where there's the task objective, and then there's a safety constraint, which is a failure constraint. Interestingly, if you think about the failure constraint, how are you going to evaluate failure? You're basically uh, going to do some sort of expectation over your trajectory or some cost function. In our case, the cost function is just a very simple binary model, failed or not. So if you really look deeply, this is yet another value function. Uh, that you're computing. It's just that you're not maximizing this value function. So if you think about your new problem statement, it's basically optimizing for some values, value function while putting a constraint on another value function. We know how to solve these problems, actually. You can write the Lagrangian of this problem in terms of value functions. You can solve with primal dual uh, gradient descent. Right? Both, of, both of these terms are represented in value functions, which we know how to compute or at least estimate. So it gives us at least, a, let's say, a framework of a safety critical algorithm. Now, the problem is that the safety estimation or the constraint estimation may not actually always be correct. Why so? So let's do a very simple rewind of how Q-learning works, right? So Q-learning uses a bootstrapping target with a new policy. However, when we think of task objectives, the expectation is over a slightly different distribution called a behavior policy or pi b. So let's say you have a true value and an estimated Q function. But the problem is the estimation error in places where you do not have many samples is actually very large. So what you really need to do is to fix this by adding a regularization, which compensates for this error when you are out of support. This new estimate is a provably conservative estimate, which has been shown so by a prior work, Kumar et al. And this is what we want for our safety model. So now we can add this regularization and get an algorithm, which is called conservative safety critic. So now what does this mean? Empirically, what this means is when you're applying this method, uh, the policy outputs an action. This conservative safety critics essentially says, is this safe to apply or not? If it is not, then this action is rejected and you resample an action. Formally, this is actually a very useful thing to do. First of all, we can show that it guarantees constraint satisfaction during training. Usually safety algorithms only guarantee these constraints at the end, not during training. And finally, we can also show that by adding the safety constraint, you're not paying too much of a cost in speed or learning efficiency. It's not that you're learning very slowly, despite the fact that you have this safety constraint. So just to give you an evaluation metric, we have a number of different algorithms that talk about constraint policy learning with Q ensembles, constraint policy optimization, uh, a base policy, and CSC, which is the conservative safety. This is the learning performance uh, in the push task. And notice that what, what you see is eventually, as time goes on, uh, the policy learns to push without toppling. More interestingly, though, if you count the number of failures during training, if you compare with uh, a base policy, a base RL policy, which may accrue somewhere between three to 400 failures, while a constraint policy that we propose only has 100 failures, which is a 4x improvement over uh, vanilla policy learning. The same sort of idea actually happens in legged locomotion as well, where you are now trying to run uh, with an initial policy that knows how to stand. So learning performance is similar across tasks, but the number of failures that we accrue is actually 2x or even more uh, better. So, so far, I talked about this idea of online RL with this conservative safety critic. You are doing learning while you're trying to minimize the number of failures. But we can extend this idea to offline RL, 
Why? Because you can say that compute is cheap, but policy deployment on a real robot is very expensive. So we update the algorithm to train to convergence completely offline and then deploy on the real robot, going back to retraining every time there is a failure. So what does this mean? Essentially, this means is I can now take compute a policy purely in the data setup and then uh, go to a real robot only when I'm sure that the policy works. And if it fails on the real robot, I go back to my training without going to, without going on to the real robot. So in this case, now we see that we can actually get something what we call deployment efficiency, which can improve number of failures even beyond what we had. So if you just remember, uh, we, we had about 150 failures on base RL and 50 failures on, uh, on online RL with CSC. But by, by doing this deployment efficient model, we can bring the failures down to actually a few tens. So another 5x improvement, if you will, uh, on this policy learning. So if you think about this, we started with 150 failures and now we have brought it down to 15 failures and, and we are working to bring it down to uh, less than a handful of these failures, which really allows us to build systems that can be practically deployed on real robots without, without, the, without the concern of the failure or the cost of the system. Uh, but this idea broadly uh, issues of uh, deployments are not limited to just sim to real, uh, not uh, safety constraints, but also sim to real because a lot of the things that we do uh, require simulation to real transfer and we need to understand uh, when and the necessity and the sufficiency of these methods. Uh, broadly, a lot of the learning methods that I've worked on have been applied on many real robots on a variety of manipulation skills. Uh, such as sorting, search, tool use, and even goal condition imitation. And not only uh, I've worked on uh, manipulation, but uh, I've also worked on combining motion planning algorithms uh, and learning-based methods on a number of surgical subtasks and subtask autonomy, which have provided a lot of um, motivation for this kind of work. So broadly, uh, I would like to sort of uh, bring us to, to one big picture takeaway that there are a number of practical challenges in robot deployment that require novel algorithms for understanding domain transfer and safety. And we also need a very systems perspective of robotics as we build scalable robotic systems. So if there's only one thing that you take away from today's talk, please let it be this. To build practical robotic systems, we need to understand what sort of structured representations and inductive biases are needed for decision-making that are different from, let's say, just vision and language. How can we learn such structured uh, inductive biases? To do so, we can use tools from causality. And finally, building real robots will require us to understand practical concerns of deployment that may not appear in more traditional machine learning problems. I've worked on a number of these problems, and this has also opened a variety of interesting uh, questions across the problems from perception, planning, data, and control. While I will not be able to get into the details of uh, a lot of the ongoing work, uh, I would like to sort of leave you with, with hopefully one lesson. The, the work that I presented today is really my effort towards building these intelligent companions. The results that I shared are not necessarily definitive, but definitely point us in the right direction of using structured representations and causal discovery. With that, I would like to thank a number of people who have been very uh, sort of invaluable along the way, stellar advisors and exceptional collaborators without whom a lot of this work would not be possible. Uh, and I would like to thank you all for being such a patient audience uh, for the last 50 minutes or so. So I'll leave this slide, which gives you sort of an idea of the things that I covered and the things that I'm working on while I am happy to answer questions. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, no, this is definitely super interesting and it's 
like especially interesting to me because I'm currently working on um, the everyday robot project at Google X. And I think I'm curious to hear, uh, have you heard about our project? And if so, um, absolutely. I know Stefan, Peter Pastor and everybody. Yeah. Okay. What's, what's your view on like how our project compared to some of the other autonomy robots? I think, first of all, I feel it's a very, like the way Google and, and the way Stefan, uh, Stefan particularly has influenced a lot of my research, uh, I would say. Uh, the approach to that problem is interesting. Uh, the choice of problem of everyday robots is also interesting to me. The robot framework or the actual robot, I've only seen in pictures and, and, and sort of like from far, but not, I don't know all of the details of it. I feel it's a very interesting direction. It remains to be seen how successful it will be in scaling robot skills, uh, because a lot of the skills that you learn in pseudo-static environments can also be learned on uh, a simulation environment. So the question can be, why do you need a real robot? Or, or when do you need a real robot at scale? What is it that you are doing that you cannot simulate or will not transfer from simulation? And there are many skills, but I'm not certain uh, if you are operating in that sort of setup. For sure. What would you say is kind of like the biggest challenge for the problem we choose? I think uh, the procedural variation in the environment is going to be very different, right? So you can learn a lot of things in simple setups. Uh, so there are problems both at the high level and at the low level. The high level problem is that you need variability in your data that you're using to train such that the model learns meaningful stuff. And at the low level, uh, often we use simplified robot end effectors. Uh, the capability of the robot is very keenly or tightly tied to what it can do. So the affordance is morphology dependent. Whether you can pick up a cup or not, or whether you can hammer or not, depends on, the, depends on what gripper you have. Uh, and and uh, I don't think as a community, we have an answer for near optimal workable gripper. While I, I agree, some people may differ from me on that. Uh, usually people start in, and, and that's a reasonably correct thing to do is to start with, let's say, uh, a parallel jaw gripper or a two finger gripper, uh, which can do a variety of things. But uh, I think one of the challenges will be a lot of the world that we interact with in the real environment is built for humans by humans. So a lot of the things that are of interest cannot actually be achieved with a simple parallel jaw gripper, especially in an everyday setting. Uh, if you go to a manufacturing setting, uh, the story is slightly different. So, so I think that is why I said uh, the choice of the domain matters as much as, uh, as, uh, as the sort of algorithms. Okay. Is there any other um, robotic company that's also in the everyday space? Well, you would know better than I do. <laughs> well, I'm kind of new to the company, so I'm just trying to learn as much as I could. Uh -huh. but, Steve, you're, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. I see there's another question, uh, Moshtaba. Do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, sure. Um... Hi, Animesh. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for your presentation. So uh, would you please go to the you know, slide that you had two causal models, so in the left and the right, you know. Uh, so, you know, I, I, my, actually, I understand your assumption about the, you know, uh, mechanism independence of each object. So each object, so the mechanism behind each object is, of course, independent from the, you know, the mechanism behind the other object. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I think, I, I'm not sure if, you know, I, I think I understand. I understood, I, I got that way, please correct me if that was something like, you know, other thing. Uh, so, uh, so you, did you assume that, you know, each object is independent from the other one, you know, in the right causal model? And if that's the case- No, so, so what we argue is basically, I think this is what you're referring to, am I correct, Mashtaba? Yes, yes, yeah. So the argument is something like this, that if you generate a true, full generative model. So what, what do I mean by generative model? If I were to write down equations of dynamics of this system, like if this two ball or two ball system, which is a very simple system, arguably, uh, blue and orange balls will depend on each other because there is no way they will not because collisions can happen. The argument is globally, they may be dependent, 
but locally, and when I use the word local, local can be in terms of time or space, right? So locally, there can be times where they are far apart. So they are not affecting each other. So locally, if, if they are far apart and they are independent, if I change the value of one of the variables to something else, it doesn't affect the, the orange ball. So in principle, whenever I can identify the local independence, I can do augmentation. Uh, it's very much like when people do this in dynamics randomization or visual randomization, you swap the background without changing the foreground. Why? Because why is this a valid thing to do? We did this and it worked, but the, it, is, it is implicitly valid only because of the fact that anything that you are doing in the foreground is independent of the background. And that is why you can randomly swap the background, right? And nothing changes for your task. It's basically the same argument that you can swap two independent things. So it's basically the principle of causal independence that I was talking about, right? Whenever I mean, yeah. you can identify, whenever you can identify the right causal independent mechanisms, then you can relabel one and you can generate new data points. And, and it's essentially, you can keep generating new data points if you can identify correct uh, mechanisms. And this is how we basically are able to add three X more data uh, to, to data sets. This is how you get data sample efficiency. So, you know, we are going to learn a causal model, you know, for, for all the objects, let's say that in one specific problem. And for that one, you know, then, then we just, let's say that we learn, uh, you know, the interaction between each object. And this, this is going, you know, we are going to decide if this object is dependent to the other object or not in that specific time, let's say, or, you know, in that specific space. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially what we're basically saying is, so first of all, this causal model doesn't have to be low level dynamics. It can be some abstract level dynamics as well, right? We are basically just saying, are these two variables causally dependent, right? And, and if, you can, uh, if you can sort of figure this out, then you can change this. A very good example may also be, let's say, does the color of the block affect how you grasp it? Probably no. Then they are causally independent variables and you can keep swapping the color and keep getting new data from a single data point. Uh, same goes with dynamics models, right? Where uh, I gave you the example of two balls and then we went from two balls to shirts and pants, right? So I can give you this example in terms of shirts and pants and it'll probably be even easier to understand, right? So now what you see is if you move the right sleeve slowly, then would you agree that it is independent of the left sleeve? Yeah, sure. Yeah, locally it is. So that's what... We yeah. That is what we want to learn, that, mm -hmm. that locally it's independent. The fact that it is independent means that I can take one data point where the left sleeve was bent and the right sleeve was straight and just straighten the left sleeve and that will be a valid data point, right? Because that is a configuration of the shirt that is viable. And that's what we are going after in counterfactual data augmentation in the sense that you want to create new viable uh, data points, not random data points, because random perturbation can push this data off the manifold very easily. Yeah, yeah, I see. I understand. Thank you for clarification. Um, Thank you. I see there's a question from uh, Jia Cheng. Do you, do you want to unmute and ask a question? Hello. Hello. Hi, Jia Cheng. Hi. Um, very nice talk. Um, thanks, Professor. Um, just a quick question to the very end um, of the presentation about safety. So I'm working in the field of um, uh, robot uh, human interaction and safety is usually a really high priority. Um, so when you're formulating the, uh, the Laguangian for by, by including the, the constraint into your um, objective function, um, I was wondering how do you uh, treat um, uh, how do you evaluate the value for the Lagrange multiplier or the lambda in the equation? Because usually in like um, model-based optimization, we can uh, explicitly so, solve for lambda. But in this case, how? So how, this how is the part. Think? This is the part where you need to do primal dual gradient descent so that you don't have to specify lambda. You can learn this thing. Oh, okay. Um, is there any uh, specific content that you recommend to, so, uh, to read further for? Um, I think I think uh, context optimization texts uh, would give you an idea of like how to do this. Um, you can look go into the paper. The paper has sufficient detail as well. So in this case, if you look at this, uh, the variable chi is is a tunable parameter, as in you have to specify how much you want uh, the safety constraint to be tight, right? 
it is equivalent. So probability of failure less than chi is a measure of how many failures you want if, in terms of expectation, if you will, right? Uh, but lambda is something that you automatically adjust uh, in this primal dual sort of uh, descent algorithm. So when you're solving for primal, right? Uh, you're solving for uh, pi. And then when you're solving the dual version, you're solving for lambdas. Oh, I see. Right? That's why there is a max min kind of thing, if you notice. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. Actually, uh, one quick question I had just following up on on this part is, can you can you handle um, like some failures might not be acceptable, like with any positive probability, and so I guess it's the the idea that you know maybe not all failures are the same, and can would you be able to incorporate a hard constraint that essentially these states cannot be visited or so we are working on that. We have not gotten what you would call zero failure guarantee. So we have got so because these guarantees are probabilistic. Uh, uh, if you push the epsilon or chi to sort of like zero or or like ten to the negative ten kind of argument, then uh, you can in principle bound it. But formally, uh, formally it can work, but practically it doesn't yet work. So I do I did show you this other result, which is the deployment efficient result, where I didn't get into the detail. So we do this. So if you see, there are two curves. So first one is what we call CSC, the green curve. Then the middle curve is the red curve, which is which we call deployment efficient CSC, which is basically just taking the CSC algorithm and applying it in an offline setting where you train in your data set. And then there is a heuristic argument, which is basically what Steve said, in the sense that in addition to actually experiencing failures, you can explicitly say, do not experience this failure right, at all. Right? So, so so then that also reduces. So what we saw is like adding, whenever you have domain specific knowledge or understanding, add additional, let's say, kinds of failures. So in this case, we said, if the torso is going down at a certain velocity, that's a bad thing, because usually you should not be going down with a very high velocity. Uh, so, uh, so that can improve gates, but we have not been able to, uh, uh, to sort of agree to Steve's point to first of all, bring that failure type to, to zero. Uh, but I think with the, so according to me, this is both sort of like a formalism issue, but also actually like a systems building issue. I feel there's more marginal juice in the system side than in the formalism side, in the sense that if you build the system properly, I with the correct heuristics, because if you really care about zero failure in certain cases, it's okay to add in some heuristics. Uh, which are easy to specify uh, to bring the failure down to literally less than like five or less than zero, like uh, not less than zero, like less than like single digit numbers, uh, right. where where this make, this starts to make like practical sense. Okay, yeah, interesting. I see we have two yeah. more questions. Maybe so, uh, Magnath, do you want to ask a question and then Luke after? Yeah. Uh, hi, Professor Gark. Thank you very much for an amazing talk. I enjoyed the entirety of it. Um, my first question goes into your choices for your key points for the uh, um, the relational dynamics as, uh, assessment. Uh, is there a way to generalize your choices? Because uh, I guess like that's something I was kind of curious about. Because like some some of those balls may not necessarily be key in understanding what exactly is going on in the video. So like, um, maybe that's something I missed here, but I was wondering if you can talk. So yes, so let's let's talk about this, right? So what do we do in this case? What we do is we have a bunch of videos uh, that we start uh, where the, uh, uh, let me actually pull this up. Let me, this is a, I think this slide will explain how this is working, right? So these are different domains where you can have different kind of input videos the only loss is reconstruction loss, right? So now the way we are learning these key points is not by specifying, like we do not know, for example, where to specify these key points. We only have a budget of key points, like eight key points or 10 key points or something like that, right? I then see. the model learns to assign these key points to salient, salient objects. So in, in the bottom figure is let's say a cube. So you see that there are five key points and, and they are sort of assigned to each to uh, a cube and then one to the yellow cube, right? And it's arbitrary. If you retrain it, perhaps two will be assigned to the yellow cube, 
right? And notice that some loss of information may be because we're not capturing, let's say, pose of the queue because it's just a key point, right? But we also capture not just the key point, we also capture a, a covariance matrix around the key point. So the covariance matrix is what allows you to, like, if you notice, the covariance matrix is what allows you to recreate the video with just the key points. So the reconstruction actually happens from key points plus heat maps. Right. So the fact that I can still capture, let's say, a rotating queue, the information is preserved in, um, in the covariance matrix, if you will. Key points in general, I have found to be reasonably sufficient in a variety of use cases, as I showed, right? We were also able to use key points here. Let me get, show you just as a reminder here. So in this case, uh, the data was also, oops. In this case, the data was also key points. And what you see on top is basically also key points. And, and each of the blob is basically the covariance matrix. So some points have larger covariance matrix while some have smaller. And then use, you can use these key points learned in an unsupervised manner also for this task. Although I completely agree key points may not be the final representation for all, uh, let's say, sorts of tasks. However, we found for a variety of manipulation and let's say decision-making tasks, whether it's driving, walking, or manipulation, uh, key points can give surprising amount of information, including for uh, uh, deformable objects as we showed. Awesome. And uh, I'm guessing these key points are something similar to SIFT and SURF, those kinds of algorithms to... No, but uh, so in this SIFT and SURF have a particular mechanisms to learn, key, like specify key points. In this case, we don't specify key points uh, in any like uh, manner. We just say that the budget is, let's say, K key points, right? So let's right. say the budget is five key points and the loss will be reconstruction. So, so assignment of key points will be learned automatically. I see. Um, my second so question- So it's not oh, safe sure. in that sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you assign a budget and the key points in that budget are assigned to each part of yeah. the video. Uh, and and this is yeah. not just our work. Number number of different people, uh, Kulkarni from MIT, um, I think my own collaborators from NVIDIA, we, a number of people have worked on this. I think um, uh, Hongluck Lee had a paper on key point based representations back in 2019 or 2018 as well. So this is not just sort of our, our own work. A number of people have used this idea. Ah, okay. Th that's really cool though. Like, especially the pose changing with the key point. Uh, my second question is, um, I actually work on uh, coverage planning under uncertainty. And I was wondering, like, uncertainty is also a reason why sometimes a robotics task could fail. And I was wondering where you've accounted for uncertainty or if you have a strategy for accounting uncertainty in your learning networks or in uh, your structured uh, robotics uh, dynamics discovery. And I was just wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. So let me be upfront. We did not. Uh, although we have done so in other projects. So I can, I can sort of speak to that. Uh, you are absolutely spot on that uncertainty uh, is sort of like a spoil sport uh, <laughs> sometimes. Uh, so how do we do this? One thing that I have learned, this is more of a broader answer rather than a specific answer for this project. In this particular case, we learn perception first, then fix that model and then learn causal prediction model and dynamics model simultaneously. Uh, what we have learned uh, in some other projects, let's say, um, uh, let me see if I can pull some of this stuff up. Uh, maybe let's see. I think I might have some of it just to sort of give you pointers to it, where we were able to explicitly show where uncertainty shows up. Uh, is this one? Okay. So this was a line of work we did. Uh, it's called neural task programming and neural uh, 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 task graphs. So. In a simple setup where you're basically doing, let's say block stacking, one could argue right. that you could do block stacking uh, with state estimation. I can do pose estimation of blocks and then uh, le learn a controller on top of this pose estimation, right? Yeah. So yeah. this is some, an experiment we explicitly did. What we found was whatever pose estimator you use or whatever state estimator you use, there will be uncertainty in it. Yeah. Uh, it will not be perfect. Now, 
that uncertainty propagates. So if you are stacking cubes and your pose estimator in cubes has, let's say, a 5% error. So if you're, if you're stacking two cubes, that 5% is completely fine. If you're stacking seven cubes, then you are basically off the center enough that the whole thing will fall off, yeah. right? So what we found was there are two ways to handle this. Either you explicitly, so your uncertainty model can capture this uncertainty explicitly and do backdrop. So if you think of KF or a Kalman filter, yeah. that's a Gaussian uncertainty. You probably need non-Gaussian or non-parametric uncertainty model that you can backdrop, like essentially do uh, iterations, iterative updates over uncertainty for non-parametric uncertainty models. There are new models that are not my work that have done that. So neural filters that do that. Another mechanism is to do end-to-end -end learning where you basically say that whatever you do, your state estimator will not be perfect. However, you can make your policy robust to that error by making sure that the training is end-to-end. -end. So this is something that we learned that end-to-end -end training even though it is a bit more, let's say, uh, sample inefficient, can get around this problem of explicitly modeling uncertainty. Uh, and I'm not saying which is the right answer. Uh, I believe the solution will be sort of end-to-end uh, -end training, but with explicit uncertainty models. Uh, currently, the explicit uncertainty models are not, let's say, tractable at scale to represent these things. Uh, uh, but but uh, this work is already, I, be, I believe, three, three and a half years old. So people have done some interesting work on, on, on uncertainty representation. Uh, a second more sort of philosophical note is uh, the problem that I have with, uh, with, uh, with some of these problem, issues of state estimation is uh, how do you know that the output representation that you're trying to capture is meaningful and sufficient? or necessary and sufficient. So let's say you are doing, you are building a pose estimator uh, and the task is to stack blocks. One could argue pose estimation is a harder task than stacking blocks. So why are you trying to force your model to do pose estimation and then uncertainty on pose estimation, uh, right? right? Because you could argue that pose estimation is an auxiliary task, but not a requirement. Right now, when we do state estimation, we make it a requirement because that's the bottleneck that you need to pass through. Yeah, right. That's an interesting thought, for sure. Because, uh, yeah, you would need the state estimation that is absolutely necessary to really uh, use. If that makes sense. Uh, thank yeah. you very much for answering my questions. Okay, uh, maybe we'll take a final question from Luke, who has his hand up, and then we'll wrap up. Luke. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Uh, very nice presentation. I have one question. Uh, when you talk about uh, you uh, integrate uh, bias into uh, uh, for, for the reputations, um, like uh, could, uh, what exact what bias exactly you're taking for for example when you uh, look at the opening door task, uh, what bias exactly you're using for that task? Okay, so let me jump to that slide. So first of all. Uh, there are two ways to think about this, right? So first of all, I'm arguing that when you think about these tasks, particularly for manipulation, uh, the bias that we are using is what should be the output space of the policy? The output space of the policy can be pure robot joint torques, right? So you can, out, you can take in observation O and output torques. Then what you require the policy to do exploration in is some sort of joint space, which may not be relevant to the task. Uh, for the door opening task, you can argue that reward can only be achieved in one latent dimension. There's only one latent dimension in which exploration is needed because all of the other latent dimensions are reward sort of like agnostic. So you can try to yank the door up or down, but you are not gonna get any reward in that dimension. So then, we are basically arguing that we can learn this latent dimension for a particular family of tasks, which is swinging open doors. Okay, so in first stage of this problem, I said, we do not know how to learn this yet. Let's specify a representation of the output space such that it's going to be more efficient. So you, you change the output space of the policy to end effectors. So this is called the task space control or operational space control, where you assume that a robot is point robot and all of the dynamics of the robot is abstracted away by using this inverse dynamics model. But in addition from just the position of that po or the pose of that end effector, we also add 
how much forces or, or the impedance gains it will use to interact with the environment, right? Are you going to push on the, on the space? Are you going to pull? Uh, so that was one. And then in the latter half of, uh, of this representation learning, we talked about if I can directly learn this bias from data, right? So if I see a lot of trajectories of someone opening a door, in principle, I should learn that the only dimension of variability is along this one dimension. Even if I don't know how to open or close the door, I should be able to explore in this dimension. And that is why we can get near zero shot performance because it learns the right underlying latent space in which exploration is one dimension. And you can imagine that uh, doing exploration in one dimension results in very efficient RF. Yeah, so this bias you learn from examples only works for like open, opening door task because you're uh, no, uh, I, we showed this. We showed this for other tasks where, uh, so in opening door, the latent dimension is one. In mm -hmm. in wiping, the latent dimension can be two. So so what you see here is basically uh, the data is only for wiping straight lines, and then you learn the action space, and then you train a policy for wiping new shapes that were not given. And what you see is SAC baseline uh, with torque control. Uh, doesn't get to, let's say, wiping the task because it doesn't know the right, let's say, abstraction, while uh, the laser baseline actually is able to achieve the task much faster. And I can show you sort of uh, uh, numerical results as well, but mainly the point is that action space transfers, not necessarily the policy. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thanks again for, the, for a great talk. Um, I really appreciate it. And thanks for sticking around to ask, answer a lot of different questions. Um, so I guess we'll end the, the talk here. And uh, thanks everyone for joining as well. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for organizing this. Thank you everyone for being uh, such a great participant and, and for all the fun, fun questions. Uh, just as a note, uh, I would be very happy uh, to chat on the sidelines if you need to, or if you have more questions, feel free to email me. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.